Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be, oh, talking to you about things that are interesting to me and I think important to me, I think deserve to be important to you as well. This is actually episode 59 of Left Side of the Aisle. It's for the week of May 31st to June 6th, 2012. Uh, a lot of people, I've, I've met, met a number of people who told me they agree with a lot of what I say. Hang on to the end of the show. You might change your mind. Uh, but um, I will say, too, that any comments, questions, reactions to the show, including this one, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which, again, as I always say, you probably didn't, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here a couple of times during the show, uh, and you can go there and get the uh, email address from there. I do answer my mail. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. I only ask that uh, you include something like your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. All right, a few things to get to today. Uh, the first one, actually, I always like to start with some kind of good news, if I can, some kind of good news. Um, on... Uh, Tuesday, May 29th, Dolores Huerta received one of the nation's highest civilian honors, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now, any liberal of my age range knows or at least should know the name Dolores Huerta. Uh, and if you either for some reason don't remember or are a liberal or, or the wrong age, I'll explain who she is. Along with Cesar Chavez, she co-founded the National Farm Workers Association, which became the United Farm Workers Union. She was its first vice president. And the great boycotts and the lettuce boycotts, which the UFW pushed uh, and organized, uh, were a, they were a constant presence throughout the, the activist years of the 1960s. The dedication and the nonviolent activism of those farm workers, backed by the economic power of those boycotts, not only succeeded in winning union recognition and in winning union contracts, uh, which, which actually had guarantees of pay and pension and safe working conditions. But perhaps more importantly, this movement won recognition of the idea of rights for uh, farm workers, their rights to decent, decent treatment and to respect. Consider uh, what, what Dolores Huerta considers her proudest accomplishments. She said they included Spanish language ballots for voters, public assistance for immigrants, toilets in the fields, drinking water protections from pesticides, and an immigration act which gave legal status to more than a million farm workers. Now, I want you to think of what that means just for a second. It means things like having toilets at your place of work, because the fields is the place of work for these people. Having toilets at your place of work. Having water, drinking water at your work that you could be confident was not contaminated with pesticides that could spread in the fields in which you then have to go out and work. Um, that simply having legal status was something that in my adult life still had to be achieved in this country for literally millions of workers. In 1960, Edward R. Murrow produced a documentary called The Harvest of Shame. Uh, you can find that on YouTube. It's still there. It's still worth watching. It described migrant workers as the forgotten ones. Now, there's still much to do. Migrant workers are still not covered by mandates for health insurance. They're still not protected about, uh, by laws about overtime or sick pay. Too many still wind up living in houses that are no more than shanty towns. But the fact is, things have improved. And thanks to people like Dolores Huerta, and the nonviolent activists of the United Farm Workers, uh, whose members withstood arrests, they withstood threats, they withstood brutality from both police and ranchers. Thanks to those sorts of people, migrant workers can no longer be thought of simply as the forgotten ones. Congratulations to Dolores Huerta. Okay, next thing. Uh, not good news, actually. Two weeks ago, I talked about what I call the loss of the commons, the, the attacks on the idea that uh, there is a community, a society, which involves shared resources and a shared community responsibility for the welfare of all. Last week, I talked about some of the means 
uh, some of the parts of that attack that involve the tax on our ability to participate in the political processes of the nation. This week, I'm going to mention some more. I've talked, for example, several times about the efforts to limit the franchise, the ability of people to cast a vote. I've usually done this in reference to these idiotic voter ID laws, uh, but that's not the only way you can do this. Another way, which I've also mentioned before, is registration restrictions. Just make it harder for people to register vote in the first place. Another way is simply to kick you off the rolls. Florida became notorious in 2000 when a purge of supposedly ineligible voters wound up wrongfully stripping thousands of mostly black, which means mostly Democratic voters, of their right to vote. Well, Florida's at it again. Florida wants to kick literally tens of thousands of people off the voting rolls using various excuses, including, uh, we think you're a felon, we think you're dead, and we think you're not a citizen. Taken together, the state says this could affect as many as 239,000 uh, voters. The state, under the baleful eye of Governor Voldemort, is pressing this even as local election officials are saying that the data being provided by the state is, is no good. They're questioning its quality, they're questioning its accuracy, they're questioning its usefulness. So why is the state continuing to push this in the face of all these questions being raised by their own local election officials. Part of an answer may be found in the interesting fact that of uh, 3,000 initial voters, an initial list of 3,000 voters to be purged from the rolls, over 60% were Latino, who were also, also mostly Democratic voters. Doubly interestingly, the state did this uh, even though it's so close to a federal election, in fact, so close that the state might have already violated a federal law regarding this, uh, it's so close to an election that people who are wrongfully kicked off the rolls because of this will not have time to get back on the rolls before the election. And that is exactly the pattern we saw back in 2000. In early May, Florida Secretary of State Ken Detzner, this year's Catherine Harris, he released a statement in which he said that the presence of just one ineligible voter on the state's voting rolls represents a real threat to the integrity of the voting process. Apparently, the possibility of thousands of eligible voters being wrongly kicked off the rolls is of no concern to him, especially if those voters are the wrong sorts of voters. Or right, something else related to this. Last week, something else I mentioned was the weaponization, what I call the weaponization of police. Uh, and that's not only seen in the what's becoming almost the routine use of pepper spray on nonviolent protesters, like the, the now notorious case at UCAL Davis. But something, it also relates to something which I haven't talked about in a while, which is tasers. It's another one of the high-tech weapons that police are increasingly using to control individuals and crowds. And the thing is, police want to be able to use tasers pretty much any way they want, any time they want, to any extent they want. In 2004, cops in Seattle uh, used a taser three times in less than a minute on a pregnant woman who refused to sign a traffic ticket because she incorrectly believed that signing was an admission of guilt. She sued the cops, but last fall, the cops won. A majority of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals found that while the cops did use excessive force, the relevant law was not clear in 2004, so the cops had what's called a qualified immunity and could not be sued. However, by its very nature, that decision also put cops on notice that future such incidents um, could well be actionable. That is, future such incidents, yeah, you could possibly be sued. So even though they won, the cops are appealing this case to the Supreme Court. They want the court to rule the tasers are, in their words, a useful pain technique, and therefore their use cannot be considered excessive force. 
It's not excessive force, they're claiming, to repeatedly taser a nonviolent, non-threatening person because the cops, and by the way, there were three of them at this scene, because these cops were either so lazy or such damned wusses that they couldn't, the three of them together, pull one woman out of the car. In a supporting brief, the Los Angeles Police Department argued that, I get this now, they said if the determination of excessive force is not overturned, quote, it won't be long before the word spreads throughout society's criminal underground that the Ninth Circuit hasn't simply given them a get-out-of-jail-free card, but a never-have-to-go-to-jail-in-the-first-place card. That's how far this madness goes. That's how much police are determined to be able to use tasers any way, any time, any how they want. The Supreme Court is supposed to decide on May 31st whether to take this case. And that's after I, I record this, but before you'll see it. Uh, next week, I will tell you what the court decided on this. And the thing is, oppressive violence from police is only one risk we face to our ability to participate in the political life of the nation. Uh, increasing surveillance is another. I mentioned last week about government moves to enable increasing surveillance of internet communications, that is, of our online life. Well, they're also working on ways to improve their ability to maintain surveillance of our physical life. This summer, the Army is to present to the FAA a demonstration of so-called ground-based sense and avoid technologies. This is to get the FAA to improve a far larger number of military drone flights in the U.S. in civilian airspace. That, that in fact, in turn, will be used, and already has been used, to get police to have the authority to do the same thing. The lobbying by both the military and private contractors on this has become intense, particularly by the latter, who see a huge market coming in local police forces having these drones. The FAA reauthorization bill, the current reauthorization bill, requires the agency to safely allow unmanned aircraft in U.S. commercial airspace by 2015. And the FAA, in response to this, recently issued guidelines that streamline the rules for cops and other public safety organizations to be able to fly drones. And in fact, the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland is actually pushing their implementation. Drone manufacturers call these things force multipliers for police. Police, on the other hand, of course, they soft-pedal the implications of this. No, they talk about finding the lost child, finding the wandering Alzheimer's patient, while in the next breath, exulting about how, they can, how with drones, they can read a license plate from 400 feet up. So in a couple of years, you can go out your front door wondering if some police eye in the sky is watching your every move. Um, talking about surveillance, how about this? The Illinois chapter of the Council on American-Islamic Relations says that across the 19 states where this organization has offices, there have been dozens of complaints by American Muslims, American citizens, discovering they are on the no-fly list for who knows what reason, and then being told by FBI agents that they can get off the no-fly list if they agree to go undercover, spy on other Muslims, and report back what they find. And remember... The only people who complain about this would be the people who said no. There's no way to know how many people said yes. There are more direct threats. We're going to take a quick break, and I'll be back to this after the break. Okay, and we're back. And continuing with the discussion about threats to our ability to participate in the politics and political process of the nation. I said there was a more direct threat, and it, I, I talked before about this, the National Defense Authorization Act. This actually includes a particular provision, Section 1022 to be precise, that would allow the government to have military to imprison people indefinitely without trial or even charge based solely on the president's assertion that the person is a suspected terrorist. On May 16th, uh, federal judge Catherine Forrest found that that provision of the law is unconstitutional, violates the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments, it violates rights of free speech and free association, violates protections against uh, improper seizures, and violates guarantees of due process. She did so after a rather Kafkaesque hearing uh, 
in which lawyers for the government repeatedly refused to explain what the law's impossibly vague terms like associated forces and substantial support actually mean. Instead, the government tried to argue that the seven plaintiffs, which included uh, journalists, researchers, activists, and actually a member of the, of the Icelandic parliament, the government argue, uh, argued these people did not have standing to sue. That is, they couldn't sue because they couldn't show the law had affected them. In other words, the government was arguing that they couldn't sue because they had not yet been indefinitely detained. So according to the government, the only people who had standing to sue were the people who had been cut off from the courts. However, even despite uh, Judge Forrest's decision, the day after that decision, the House of Representatives voted to keep that provision intact. They rejected an amendment that would have guaranteed civilian trials for any terrorism suspect arrested in the United States. I mean, they said, the proponents of this said that letting the president decide on their own, um, uh, and it includes Americans that could be detained, to let the president decide on their own, uh, it was giving the executive too much power. And plus the fact there had been over 400 suspected terrorists who have been tried and convicted in civilian courts in the United States. And there have been dozens of, of plots, real or supposed, uh, which have been foiled. So I said, what, what is the need for this? But the opponent said, oh, no, no, we can't have that. We can't, no, that would tie the president's hands. And the president must have complete freedom to, in essence, be a military dictator, because don't you know we're at war? And besides, oh, by the way, it would give terrorists special rights, they said. I bet you might be a little surprised to learn that, ha that a trial is a special right. Now, when this provision uh, of, the, of the, what was known as the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, was, when this provision was first passed, the supporters of the provision responded to concerns about civil liberties by calling them silly, says the provision wouldn't apply to Americans. That's, don't be daft. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now, like right-wingers so often do, they are airily acknowledging what they previously vociferously denied. Because now everyone agrees that, except for the injunctive relief provided by Judge Forrest, everyone agrees that federal law now says that the president, this or any future president, has the power to imprison anyone, including American citizens taken on American soil, indefinitely and imprison them indefinitely and without charge, based solely on the president's unreviewable, uncheckable uh, assertion that um, well, I think you're giving substantial support, whatever that means, to a terrorist-associated force, whatever that means. And the thing is, I do mean everyone. I do mean everyone. Back in February, the White House released rules that waived uh, Barack Obama's authority under the provision in question. But the thing is, by waiving the authority, you are acknowledging the authority exists and could be asserted by any future administration. And to make this doubly bizarre, the statement insisted that the provision does not apply to U.S. citizens. But in the hearing before Judge Forrest, the lawyers for the government refused to say that the provisions would not be used against the U.S. citizens who were among the plaintiffs. All right, that, frankly, that's enough for now on this. I'm sure I'll have more in the future. That's enough for this right now. So instead, we're going to move to our regular feature, the Outrage of the Week. On May 24th, the Supreme Court issued its decision in the case of Freeman v. Quicken Loans. You probably never heard about this, but you should. The case arises, it was a consolidation of a group of suits out of Louisiana, in which borrowers charged that Quicken Loans violated the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, or RESPA, by charging them loan discount fees uh, on their mortgages without providing them lower rate mortgages in return. In other words, they charge them fees for services that were never rendered. Well, according to, an, to a unanimous decision of the U.S. Supreme Court, that's just fine. The law in question, they say, requires that these unearned fees be split with a third party. And since there was no third party, there was only Quicken Loans sucking up all this extra cash for themselves um, for do and pocketing the cash for doing nothing. Well, they were free to do so and jolly good for them. 
As a result of this decision, technically right now, mortgage lenders can legally cheat home buyers out of hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees in return for doing nothing at all. Put another way, the Supreme Court has now found that by not specifically referring to single party fraud, Congress intended to allow your mortgage company to rip you off so long as they don't share it with anybody else. Now, circuit courts had been split on this. Some said, yeah, the third party had to be involved and some hadn't, which clearly means you could argue that, so, that a third party was not required. But Supreme Court came down on the side of the corporations against the individuals. Now, based on its record of the past couple of decades, that really is no surprise. But the fact is, even if it's no surprise, it remains an outrage. It is the outrage of the week. Okay, finally for today, a few thoughts on heroism. Uh, this show has been recorded on May 30th, which is the traditional Memorial Day. Um, before Memorial Day became, became more important to have a three-day weekend. Uh, so I want to quote something that I post on my blog every year right around this time. In May 2002, someone on a mailing list I was on posted a message asking people to take a moment of silence on Memorial Day, saying, let us ensure that those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom are not forgotten. In response, I wrote, and in that silent moment, remember, too, the many nonviolent warriors who struggled, searched, sacrificed for justice and freedom, who remain without songs or memorials to celebrate their lives or their passing, but who at some moment stood weaponless against the machinery of oppression and showed in their simple no more a force that can move history. There's this guy, Chris Hayes. He is a journalist at MSNBC, and he has a news and commentary program on, weekday, on weekend mornings. He sparked some controversy on Sunday with an observation on the topic of heroism. In the video, you can see that he's struggling to, to find the right words to say what he means. Uh, and after noting that, quoting him, it is very difficult to talk about the war dead and the fallen without invoking valor, without invoking the word heroes, he said he's uncomfortable with the word hero because it seems to me that it is so rhetorically proximate to justifications for more war. He went on to say that, of course, there can be heroism in combat, but it seems to me, he said, that we marshal the word in a way that is problematic. Problematic, that is, because the image of all soldiers killed in war as heroes makes it too easy to promote more wars. And, of course, there was a blaze of outrage protest, and, of course, later on he apologized. It was, however, a sort of a non-apology apology, because he expressed regret for coming across as a removed pundit, disconnected from the actual emotions of a decade of war, but not for the actual sentiment, which is good because he should not apologize for that sentiment and he should not apologize for anything he said with the possible exception of the phrase uh, rhetorically proximate. The point is the sentiment is true. In fact, I said much the same thing in even stronger language four years ago. Uh, I'm going to be referring to a blog post I wrote in June of 2008. If you want to see it, you can find the whole thing, you can read the whole thing, just go to my blog um, and uh, do a search on the word heroics and it'll come up. My focus in that post was actually somewhat different than that we're talking about here. I was addressing what I call the disturbing and increasing tendency among progressives to adulate all things military, which is happening, I argued, because the left was thinking it was a path to legitimacy on national security issues, that we had to prove for some reason that we were as tough as pro-military as ready to go to war as anybody. But knowing in advance where this post was going to lead, and uh, understanding Hayes' struggle with his words, the piece opened by saying, and I'm quoting here, I've tried various ways to start this, wanting to make sure I say what I mean and only what I mean, but I've come to realize that there is no way that will not be misunderstood either accidentally or deliberately by some. So I gave up trying to do anything other than say it outright. What I said a little further down was, let me be clear here, and again I'm quoting myself here, 
Let me be clear here, soldiers are not heroes. A hero is someone who by definition is in some way extraordinary, remarkable, worthy of emulation. It is at best a risky business to define someone as extraordinary simply by virtue of wearing a uniform, and in fact it is potentially dangerous as it makes it too easy to slip in the militaristic attitude that what soldiers do goes beyond necessary evil, beyond even just necessary, beyond even honorable to admirable, to something to celebrate. An attitude that makes it all too easy to promote additional enlistments, additional weapons, and additional wars. Our whole approach to this, it distorts our way of thinking. It drops a magnet on our moral compass. War and its symbiotic partner, militarism, do not recognize good or good and bad, but they only recognize life and death and ultimately only winner and loser. And war and militarism will feed off one person's blood as readily as off another. Or as I put it some years ago, every war is just when modified by the adjective my. Militarism destroys souls right along with flesh. War blows away conscience as readily as concrete. So no, soldiers are not heroes. A fact which seems clearer very often more to the soldiers than it does to those people who worship them from afar, from their chicken hawks, who just love war as long as they don't have to take part in it. Soldiers are not heroes. Now they can be heroes. Okay, soldiers can be heroes. They can act heroically. They can do heroic things. But heroes are defined by their actions in life. And the act of putting on a uniform and agreeing to put your conscience in a lockbox for the next however many years does not make your life more important than others. It does not make your death more important than others. It does not exempt you from moral judgment. It does not make your life any better or any more worthy than anybody else's. It does not make you a hero, and we should not fall prey to hero worship. All right, that's it for me. That's it for me for today. Uh, I do want to remind you, if after that you still feel like being in the same room with me, um, on June 16th, we're having our open house uh, down here on, uh, from noon to 6, down here at, at the Carver High School where the uh, studios are. I want you to come on by and see what's going on here and see how you can get involved. There will be some live programming, including me. Um, so um, feel free to uh, come on down and get involved. But uh, for right now, I think I'm just going to wrap up there. And I'm just going to say that, um, well, I hope you have the best week you possibly can. And um, we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>